Chapter Fourteen of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rachel's story. Hello, Fult. Fibsy sang out gaily to the chauffeur and received a pleasant response. For few could resist the contagious smile of the round, freckled face of the boy. Hello, Mr. Fibsy. The other returned. How are you getting on with your detective work? Fine, but I want a little help from you. Me? I don't know anything about anything. Well, then, tell me what you don't know. That fire now, here in the garage, the night of the murder, did you ever find out how it started? Fulton's face took on a perplexed look, and he said, No, we didn't, and it's a queer thing. It must have been started by someone purposely, for there's no way it could have come about by accident. Spontaneous combustion? Whatever made you think of that? And it couldn't have been from old paint rags or such, for there's nothing like that about. But, well, here's what I found. Fulton produced a small bottle. It was empty and had no label or stopper, and Fibsy looked at it blankly. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Never see one like it?' "'No, have you?' "'Yes, I have. I was in the war, and bottles like that contained acid, which, when combined with another acid, caused spontaneous combustion. Combined? How? Well, they used to saturate some cloth or old clothes with the other acid and throw them about. Then, when the time came, they threw a little bottle like that, filled with acid, and with only a paper stopper, in among the clothes. The acid slowly ate out the paper stopper, and then the two acids caused combustion. So by the time the fire started, the man who was responsible for it was far away from the scene. Hugh, and you think that happened here? There's the bottle. The fire began in Mr. Appleby's car. Two coats and a rug were burned. Now, mightn't they have been sprinkled with the other acid? Of course, that's what happened. Why haven't you told this before? I only found the bottle this morning. It had been kicked under a bench, and the sweeper found it. Then I fell a-thinking, for it's the very same sort of bottle I saw used over there. Somebody who knew that trick did it. And whoever did it is either Mr. Appleby's murderer or an accomplice. You think the two crimes are connected, then? Haven't a doubt of it. You're a clever chap, Fulton, to dope this out. Well, there was no other explanation. Anything else hinted at carelessness of my management of this place, and that hurt my pride, for I like to think this garage the pink of perfection as to cleanliness and order. Mr. Wheeler is fortunate in having such a man as you. Now one more thing, Fulton. Where is Rachel? Rachel! Yes, your blush gives you away. If you know where she is, tell me. If she's done nothing wrong, it can do no harm to find her. If she has done anything wrong, she must be found. I don't know where she is, Mr. Fibsy. Call me McGuire, and if you don't know where she is, you know something about her disappearance. When did she go away? I saw her last night. She said nothing about going away, but she seemed nervous and worried, and I couldn't say anything to please her. Can't you form an idea of where she might have gone? Be frank, Fulton, for much depends on getting hold of that girl. I can only say I've no idea where she is, but she may communicate with me. In that case... In that case, let me know at once. Fibsy commanded, and having learned all he could there, he went off to think up some other means of finding the lost Rachel. Meantime, Sam Appleby was taking his departure. I have to go, he said, in response to the Wheeler's invitation to tarry longer, because Keefe is coming down tomorrow. One of us ought to be in Father's office all the time now. There's so much to attend to. Why is Mr. Keefe coming here? 
asked Maida. Mr. Stone wants to see him, Appleby informed her. You know, Keefe is more or less a detective himself, and Mr. Stone thinks he may be helpful in finding the criminal. Miss Lane is coming also. She begged to, mostly, I think because she took such a liking to you. I liked her too, returned Maida. She's a funny girl, but a sincere, thorough nature. Yes, she is. Well, they'll only stay over a day or two. I can't spare them longer. Of course, they may be of help to Mr. Stone, and they may not. But I don't want to miss a trick in this investigation. What a queer little chap that boy of Stone's is. Fibsy? And Maida smiled. Yes, he's a case, and he's my devoted slave. As who isn't? exclaimed Appleby. Oh, Maida, do give me a little encouragement. After this awful business is all over, mayn't I come back with a hope that you'll smile on me? Don't talk that way, Sam. You know I'm engaged to Geoffrey. Oh, no, you're not. I mean, it can be possible for you to change your mind. Girls are often engaged to several men before they marry. I'm not that sort. And Maida smiled a little sadly. Be that sort, then. You seem to forget that I may be openly accused of crime at any moment, and a crime that hits you pretty closely. Don't say such things, dear. Neither you nor any of your people are responsible for the dreadful thing that happened to Father, or, if you are, I never want to know it. And I do want you, Maida, dear. So much. Hush, Sam. I won't listen to anything like that from you. Not now, but later on, he urged. Tell me that I may come back, Maida, dear. Of course you may come here whenever you like, but I hold out no hope of the sort you ask for. I shall hope all the same. I'd die if I didn't. Goodbye, Maida, for this time. He went away to the train, and later came Keefe and Genevieve Lane. Oh, the girl cried, I'm so glad to be back here again, Maida. My, but you're prettier than ever. If you'd only touch up those pale cheeks, just a little bit. Here, let me. She opened her ever-ready vanity box and was about to apply a touch of rouge, but Maida sprang away from her. No, no, Genevieve, I never use it. Silly girl, you don't deserve the beauty nature gave you if you're not willing to help it along a little yourself. How do you do, Mrs. Wheeler and Mr. Wheeler? She greeted them prettily, and Keefe, too, exchanged greetings with the family. Anything being done, he asked finally. Has Mr. Stone discovered anything of importance? Nothing very definite, I fear, returned Daniel Wheeler. He spoke wearily and almost despairingly. Anxiety and worry had aged him, even in the last few days. I do hope, Keefe, that you can be of assistance. You have a keen eye for details, and you may know or remember some points that escaped our notice. I'm hoping I can help, Keefe returned with a serious face. Can I see Stone shortly? Yes, now. Come along into the den. He's in here. The two men went to the den where Stone and Fibsy were in deep consultation. Very glad to see you, Mr. Keefe, Fleming Stone acknowledged the introduction. This is McGuire, my young assistant. You may speak frankly before him. If I have anything to speak, said Keefe, I don't really know anything I haven't told, but I may remind Mr. Wheeler of some points he has forgotten. Well, let's talk it all over, Stone suggested, and they did. Keefe was greatly surprised and impressed by the story of the cook's having seen a man on the south veranda at the time of the shooting. But she didn't see him clearly, Fibsy added. Couldn't she describe him? No, she didn't see him plain enough. But the maid, Rachel, told Cook that she saw the man too and that he'd carried a bugle. Cook didn't see the bugle. Naturally not, if she only saw the man vaguely, said Wheeler. 
but it begins to look as if there must have been a man there, and if so, he may have been the criminal. Let us hope, said Keefe earnestly. Now can you find this man, Mr. Stone? We've got to find him, Stone returned, whether we can or not. It's really a baffling case. I think we've discovered the origin of the fire in the garage. He told the story that Fibsy had learned from the chauffeur, and Keefe was greatly interested. What are the acids? he asked. I don't know the exact names, Stone admitted, but they are of such powers as Fulton described, and the thing is plausible. Here's the bottle. He offered the little vial for inspection, and Keefe looked at it with some curiosity. The theory being, he said, that the murderer first arranged for a fire in our car, in Mr. Appleby's car, and then waited for the fire to come off as planned. Then, at the moment of greatest excitement, he being probably the man the servant saw, shot through the bay window and killed Mr. Appleby. You were fortunate, Miss Maida, that you weren't hit first. Oh, I was in no danger. I sat well back in the window seat, and over to one side, out of range of a shot from outside. And too, Mr. Keefe, I can scarcely discuss this matter of the shot from outside, as I am myself the confessed criminal. Confessing only to save me from suspicion, said her father, with an affectionate glance. But it won't do any good, dear. I take the burden of the crime, and I own up that I did it. This man on the veranda, if indeed there was such a one, may have been any of the men-servants about the place, startled by the cry of the fire, and running to assure himself of the safety of the house and family. He doubtless hesitates to divulge his identity, lest he be suspected of shooting. That's all right, declared Fibsy. But if it was one of your men, he'd own up by this time. He'd know he wouldn't be suspected of shooting Mr. Appleby. Why should he do it? Why should anybody do it except myself? asked Dan Wheeler. Not all the detectives in the world can find anyone else with a motive and opportunity. The fact that both my wife and daughter tried to take the crime off my shoulders only makes me more determined to tell the truth. But you're not telling the truth, Dad. And Maida looked at him. You know I did it. You know I had threatened to do it. You know I felt I just could not stand Mr. Appleby's oppression of you another day. And so, and so, I... Go on, Miss Wheeler, urged Stone. And so you... What did you do? I ran across the den to the drawer where Father keeps his pistol. I took it out and shot. Then I ran back to the window seat. What did you do with the pistol? Threw it out of the window. Toward the right or left? Why, I don't know. Try to think. Stand up there now and remember which way you flung it. Reluctantly, Maida went to the bay window and stood there thinking. I don't know, she said at last. I can't remember. It doesn't matter, said Keefe. I think we can prove that it was none of the wheelers. But there was a man, an intruder, on the veranda who shot. Even if we never find out his identity, we may prove that he was really there. Where is this maid who saw him clearly? Rachel. Is that her name? That's a pretty thing, too, Fibsy spoke up. She has flew the coop. Gone? Where? Keefe showed his disappointment. Nobody knows where. She just simply lit out. Even her lover doesn't know where she is. Who is her lover? Fulton, the chauffeur. He's just about crazy over her disappearance. Oh, she'll return, surmised Stone. She became frightened at something and ran off. I think she'll come back. If not, we'll have to give chase. We must find her, as she's the principal witness of the man on the veranda. Cook is not so sure about him. Who could he have been? Keefe said. Doubtless some enemy of Mr. Appleby, in no way connected with the Wheelers. Probably, agreed Stone. 
we found the pistol you know mr keefe remarked fibsy you did well you have made progress where was it in the fern bed not far from the veranda railing just where the man would have thrown it exclaimed keefe or where i threw it put in daniel wheeler i'd like to see the exact place it was found keefe said come on i'll show you offered fibsy and the two started away together here you are and fibsy showed the bed of ferns which growing closely together made a dense hiding place a wonder you ever found it said keefe how'd you happen to oh i just snooped around till i came to it i says to myself either the murderer flung it away or he didn't if he did why it must be somewheres and it was i see and does mr stone think the finding of it here points to either of the wheelers not necessarily you see if the man we're looking for did the shooting he's the one who threw the pistol in this here fern bed and you know yourself it's more likely a man threw this farther than a woman miss wheeler is athletic i know but i'm convinced that miss wheeler didn't do the deed ain't you oh i can't think she did it of course but it's all very mysterious not mysterious a bit it's hard sledding but it ain't much mystery about it why look a here if either the father or daughter did it they both know which one it was therefore one is telling the truth and one isn't it won't be hard to find out which is which but f stone he's trying to find someone that'll let the wheelers both out oh that's his idea and a mighty good one i'll help all i can of course the thing to do is trace the pistol oh it was mr wheeler's pistol all right it was keefe looked dismayed then how can we suspect an outsider well he could have stolen mr wheeler's pistol for the purpose of casting suspicion on him yes that's so now to find that rachel oh do find her maida cried overhearing the remark as she and genevieve crossed the lawn toward keefe and fibsy the lad had not seen miss lane and he frankly admired her at once perhaps a sympathetic chord was struck by the similarity of their natures perhaps they intuitively recognized each other's gay impudence for they engaged in a clash of words that immediately made them friends maybe rachel'd come back if she knew you were here he said i'm sure she'd admire to wait on such a pretty lady just tell her that you saw me genevieve said and i'll be glad to have her back she's a first-class lady's maid oh then she only waits on first-class ladies yes that's why she's so fond of me do hunt her up well cutie just for you i'll do that same where shall i go to look for her how should i know but you keep watch of fulton and i'll bet he gets word from her yes they're sweethearts now how do sweethearts get word to each other you ought to know all about sweethearting i don't said genevieve demurely pshaw now that's too bad want me to teach you yes if you don't mind saunter away with me then and the saucy boy led miss lane off for a stroll round the grounds honest now do you want to help he asked yes i do she asserted i'm downright fond of maida and though i know she didn't do it yet she and her father will be suspected unless we can find this other person and the only way to get a line on him seems to be through rachel why do you suppose she ran away can't imagine don't see how she could get scared no what would scare her i think she's at some neighbors let's you and me go to all the neighbors and see all right we'll go in the wheeler's little car fulton can take us don't we get permission nixie they might say no by mistake for a yes come on 
we'll just hook jack to the garage they went and easily persuaded fulton to take them around to some of the neighboring houses and at the third one they visited they found rachel a friend of hers was a maid there and she had taken rachel in for a few days why did you run off queried fulton oh i don't know and rachel shuddered it's all got on my nerves who's over there now just the family and the detectives and mr keefe fulton answered will you come home she will fibsy answered for her she will get right into this car and go at once in the name of the law he added sternly as rachel seemed undecided fibsy often used this phrase and delivered in an awe-inspiring tone it was usually effective rachel did get into the car and they returned to sycamore lodge in triumph good work fibs stone nodded his approval now rachel sit right down here on the veranda and tell us about that man you saw the girl was clearly frightened and her voice trembled but she tried to tell her story there's nothing to fear curtis keefe said kindly just tell slowly and simply the story of your seeing the man and then you may be excused she gave him a grateful look and seemed to take courage well i was passing the veranda coming from where and going where interrupted stone speaking gently why i i was coming from the the garage where you had been talking to fulton yes sir all right go on and i was going going to go up to mrs wheeler's room i thought she might want me and as i went by the veranda i saw the man he was a big man and he carried a bugle he didn't blow on it no sir just waved it about like you didn't see that he had a pistol i i couldn't say sir of course you couldn't said keefe men with pistols don't brandish them until they get ready to shoot but you saw this man shoot went on stone yes sir rachel said i saw him shoot through the bay window and then i ran away whereupon she repeated the action at the conclusion of her statement and hurried away hm said fleming stone End of chapter 14chapter 15 of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this levervox recording is in the public domain the awful truth well fibs said stone as the two sat alone in concave what about rachel's story you know f stone how i hate to doubt a lady's word but not to put too fine a point upon it the fair rachel lied you think so too eh and just why under orders she was coached in her part told exactly what to say by whom oh you know as well as i do you're just leading me on well he coached her all right and she got scared before the performance came off and that's why she ran away yes i agree to all that keefe of course being the coach yes sir he's doing it to save the wheelers you see he's so desperately in love with miss maida that it sort of blinds his judgment and cleverness just how well you know his is love at first sight practically look here terence you know a great deal about love yes sir it comes natural to me i'm a born lover i am had much experience not yet but my day's coming well never mind me to get back to friend keefe here's the way it is miss wheeler is sort of engaged to mr allen and yet the matter isn't quite settled either i get that from the servants mean to gossip but that's all fair in love and sleuthing now mr keefe comes along sees the lovely maida and zip his heart is cracked 
all might yet be well but for the wily genevieve she has her cap set for keefe and he knows it and was satisfied it should be so till he saw miss wheeler now the fat's in the fire and no pitch hot you do pick up a lot of general information it's necessary sir the red-head nodded emphatically these side lights often point the way to the great and shining truth for don't you see mr keefe being so gone on miss maida naturally doesn't want her or her people suspected of this crime even if one of them is guilty so he fixes up a cock and bull story about a bugle man on the south veranda this man he argues did the shooting he gets rachel he must have had some hold on her barbary wouldn't be enough and he fair crams the bugler yarn down her throat and orders her to recite it as gospel truth then she gets scared and runs away exactly you see it that way don't you mr stone the earnest little face looked up to the master terence mcguire was developing a wonderful gift for psychological detective work and sometimes he let his imagination run away with him in such cases stone tripped him up and turned him back to the right track both had an inkling that the day might eventually come when stone would retire and mcguire would reign in his stead but this was as yet merely a dream and at present they worked together in unison and harmony yes fibsy at least i see it may have been that way but it's a big order to put on to mr keefe i know but he's a big man i mean a man of big notions and projects anybody can see that now he's awful anxious miss wheeler and mr wheeler shall be cleared of all suspicion even if he thinks one of them is guilty he doesn't consider mrs wheeler i guess nobody does now probably not go on well so keefe he thinks if he can get this bugler person guaranteed by a reliable and responsible witness which of course rachel would seem to be then mr keefe thinks he's got the wheelers cleared now rachel getting cold feet about it all goes back on keefe oh i could see it in his face yes he looked decidedly annoyed at rachel's failure of a convincing performance he did so now mr stone even if he bolsters up rachel's story or gets her to tell it more convincingly we know you and i that it isn't true there wasn't any man on the south veranda sure terence yes sir i'm pretty sure for what became of him where did he vanish to who was he there was never any bugler i mean as a murderer the piper who piped some nights previous had nothing to do with the case sure terence oh come now mr stone i was sure till you say that at me so dubious like and then i'm not so sure well go on with your theory and let's see where you come out you may be on the right track after all i'm not sure of many points myself yet all right to my mind it comes back to a toss-up between miss maida and her father with the odds in favor of the old gentleman agree i might if i understood your english the odds in favor of mr wheeler indicating his guilt or innocence his guilt i meant f stone i can't think that sweet young lady would do it and this isn't because she is a sweet young lady but because it isn't hardly plausible that she's put the thing over even though she was willing enough to do so it seems so to me too but we can't bank on that maida wheeler is a very impulsive girl very vigorous and athletic and very devoted to her father she worships him and she has been known to say she would willingly kill old mr appleby these things must be remembered fibsy that's so but i've noticed that when folks threaten to kill people they most generally don't do it i've also noticed that but striking out maida's name leaves us only mr wheeler well ain't he the one 
ain't he the downtrodden oppressed victim who at last has opportunity and who is goaded to the point of desperation by the arguments of his enemy you grow oratorical but i admit you have an argument course i have now say we've got to choose between miss wheeler and mr wheeler how do we go about it how why we find out how mr appleby was sitting how mr wheeler was facing at the moment and also miss maida's position then we find out the direction from which the bullet entered the body and then we can tell who fired the shot i've done all that fibs stone returned with no note of superiority in his voice i found out all those things and the result proves that the bullet entered mr appleby's body from the direction of miss maida in the bay window and directly opposite from what would have been its direction if fired by mr wheeler from where he stood when seen directly after the shot fibsy looked dejected he made no response to this disclosure for a moment then he said all right f stone in that case i'm going over to mr keefe's side and i'm going to hunt up the bugler a fictitious person maybe he ain't so fictitious after all and the redhead shook doggedly a tap at the door of stone's sitting-room was followed by a may i come in at the entrance of daniel wheeler the time has come mr wheeler stone began a little abruptly to put all our cards on the table i've investigated things pretty thoroughly and though i'm not all through with my quest i feel as if i must know the truth as to what you know about the murder i have confessed wheeler began but stone stopped him that won't do he said very seriously i've proved positively that from where you stood you could not have fired the shot it came from the opposite direction now it's useless for you to keep up that pretense of being the criminal which i've no doubt you're going to shield your daughter confide in me mr wheeler it will not harm the case god help me i must confide in somebody cried the desperate man she did do it i saw maida fire the shot oh can you save her i wouldn't tell you this but i think i hope you can help better if you know you'll find it out anyway of course i should now let us be strictly truthful you saw miss maida fire the pistol yes i was sitting almost beside appleby he was nearer maida than i was and she sat in the bay window reading she sits there much of the time and i'm so accustomed to her presence that i don't even think about it we were talking pretty angrily appleby and i really renewing the old feud and adding fuel to its flame with every word i suppose maida listening grew more and more indignant at his injustice and cruelty to me those terms are not too strong and she being of an impulsive nature even revengeful when her love for me is touched and i suppose she somehow possessed herself of my pistol and fired it you were not looking at her before the shot oh no the shot rang out appleby fell forward and even as i rose to go to his aid i instinctively turned toward the direction from which the sound of the shot had come there i saw maida standing white-faced and frightened but with a look of satisfied revenge on her dear face i felt no resentment at her act then indeed i was incapable of coherent thought of any sort i stepped to appleby's side and i saw at once that he was dead had died instantly i cannot tell you just what happened next it seemed ages before anybody came and then suddenly the room was full of people allen and keefe came running the servants gathered about my wife appeared and maida was there i had a strange undercurrent of thought that kept hammering at my brain to the effect that i must convince everybody that i did it to save my girl i was clear-headed to the extent of planning my words in an effort to carry conviction of my guilt 
but that effort so absorbed my attention that i gave no heed to what happened otherwise thank you mr wheeler for your kindness i assure you you will not regret it you're going to save her you can save my little girl oh mr stone i beg of you the agonized father broke down completely and stone said kindly keep up a good heart mr wheeler that will help your daughter more than anything else you can do i assumed that if one of you were guilty the other was shielding the criminal but your story has straightened out the tangle considerably let me ask something please broke in fibsy say mr wheeler did you see the pistol in miss maida's hands i can't say i did or didn't wheeler replied listlessly i looked only at her face i know my daughter's mind so well that i at once recognized her expression of horror mingled with relief she had really desired the death of her father's enemy and she was glad it had been accomplished it's a terrible thing to say of one's own child but i've made up my mind to be honest with you mr stone in the hope of your help i should have persisted in my own story of guilt had i not perceived it was futile in the face of your clear-sighted logic and knowledge of the exact circumstances you did wisely but say nothing to any one else for the present do not even talk to miss maida about it until i have time to plan our next step it is still a difficult and very delicate case a single false move may queer the whole game you think then you can save maida oh do give a tortured man a gleam of hope i shall do my best you know they rarely if ever convict a woman and too miss wheeler had great provocation then what about self-defense appleby threatened neither of us wheeler said that can't be used well we'll do everything we can you may depend on that stone assured him and wheeler went away relieved at the new turn things had taken though also newly concerned for maida's safety nice old chap said fibsy to stone he stuck to his faked yarn as long as the sticking was good and then he caved in open and shut case terence open but not yet shut f stone now where do we go from here you go where you like boy leave me to grub at this alone without another word fibsy left the room he well knew when stone spoke in that serious tone that great thoughts were forming in that fertile brain and sooner or later he would know of them but at present his company was not desired the boy drifted out on the terraced lawn and wandered about among the gardens he too thought but he could see no light ahead so long as the old man saw her he observed to himself there's no more to be said he'd never say he saw her shoot if he hadn't seen her he's at the end of his rope and even if they acquit the lady i don't want to see her dragged through a trial but where's any way of escape what can turn up to contradict a straight story like that who else can testify except the eyewitness who has just spoken i wonder if he realized himself how conclusive his statement was but he trusted in f stone to get maida off somehow queer how most folks think a detective is a magician and can do the impossible trick in a brown study he walked slowly along the garden paths and was seen by keefe and maida who sat under the big sycamore tree crazy idea stone bringing that kid keefe said with a laugh yes but he's a very bright boy maida returned i've been surprised at his wise observations poppycock he gets off his speeches with that funny mixture of newsboy slang and detective jargon and you think they're cleverer than they are perhaps agreed maida not greatly interested but what a strange story rachel told do you believe it mr keefe yes i do the girl was frightened i think 
first at the information she tried to divulge and second by finding herself in the limelight she seems to be shy and i dare say the sudden publicity shook her nerves but why shouldn't her story be true why should she invent all that i don't know i'm sure but it didn't sound like rachel the whole thing i mean she seemed acting a part nonsense you imagine that but never mind her i've something to tell you i know maida mind you i know what mr appleby meant by the speech which i took to be mr keefe and the airship maida's face went white oh no she cried involuntarily oh no yes keefe went on and i know now that he said airship not strange i misunderstood for the words are of the same sound and then i had no reason to think of myself in connection with an airship and and have you now yes i have i've been over mr appleby's papers as i had a right to do you know i was his confidential secretary and he kept no secrets from me except those he wanted to keep go on said maida calm now and her eyes glistening with an expression of despair need i go on you know the truth you know that i am the rightful heir of this whole place sycamore ridge is mine and not your mother's yes the word was scarce audible poor maida felt as if the last blow had fallen she had seared her conscience defied her sense of honor crucified her very soul to keep this dreadful secret from her parents for their own sake and now all her efforts were of no avail curtis keefe knew that the great estate was legally his and now her dear parents would be turned out homeless penniless and broken down by sorrow and grief even though he might allow them to stay there they wouldn't she knew consent to any such arrangement she lifted a blanched stained face to his as she said what what are you going to do just what you say keefe replied drawing closer to her side it's all up to you maida dear don't look offended surely you know i love you surely you know my one great desire is to make you my wife give your consent say you will be mine and rest assured dearest there will be no trouble about the airship if you will marry me i will promise never to divulge the secret so long as either of your parents live they may keep this place and besides that darling i will guarantee to get your father a full pardon i well i'm not speaking of it yet but i'll tell you that there is a possibility of my running for governor myself since young sam is voluntarily out of it but in any case i have influence enough in certain quarters influence increased by knowledge that i have gleaned here and there among the late mr appleby's papers to secure a full and free pardon for your father now maida girl even if you don't love me very much yet can't you say yes in view of what i offer you how can you torture me so surely you know that i am engaged to mr allen i didn't know it was a positive engagement but anyway his voice grew hard it seems to me that any one so solicitous for her parents welfare and happiness as you have shown yourself will not hesitate at a step which means so much more than others you have taken oh i don't know what to do what to say let me think yes dear think all you like take it quietly now remember that a decision in my favor means also a calm peaceful and happy life insured to your parents refusal means a broken shattered life a precarious existence and never a happy day for them again can you hesitate i'm not so very unpresentable as a husband you may not love me now 
but you will i'll be so good to you that you can't help it nor do i mean to win your heart only by what i shall do for you for maida dearest love begets love and you will find yourself slowly perhaps but surely giving me your heart and we will be so happy is it yes my darling the girl stared at him her big brown eyes full of agony you forget something she said slowly i am a murderess hush don't say that awful word you are not and even if you were i'd prove you are not listen maida if you'll promise to marry me i'll find the real murderer not you or your father but the real murderer i'll get a signed confession i'll acquit you and your family of any implication in the deed and i'll produce the criminal himself now will you say yes you can't do all that she said speaking in an awestruck whisper as if he had proposed to perform a miracle i can i swear it then if you can do it you ought to do it anyway in the interests of right and justice in common honesty and decency you ought to tell what you know maida i am a man and i am in love with you that explains much i will do all i have promised to gain you as my bride but not otherwise as to right and justice you've confessed the crime haven't you yes do you confess it to me now do you say to me that you killed samuel appleby there was but a moment's pause and then maida said in a low tone yes i confess it to you mr keefe then do you see what i mean when i say i will produce the murderer do you see that i mean to save you from the consequences of your own rash act and prove you to the world at large innocent keefe looked straight into maida's eyes and her own fell in confusion can you do it she asked tremulously when i say i will do a thing i've already proved to my own satisfaction that i can do it but i'll do it only at my own price the price being you you dear delicious thing oh maida you've no idea what it means to be loved as i love you i'll make you happy my darling i'll make you forget all this horrible episode i'll give you a fairyland life you shall be happier than you ever dreamed of but geoffrey oh i can't then miss wheeler you must take the consequences all the consequences can you do that no maida said after an interval of silence i can't i'm forced to accept your offer mr keefe you may not accept it with that address curtis then curtis i say yes end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this Levervox recording is in the public domain maida's decision maida it cannot be i shall never let you marry mr keefe when i know how you love geoffrey sarah wheeler spoke quietly but her agonized face and tear-filled eyes told of her deep distress though not demonstrative she loved her daughter her only child with an affection that was almost idolatry and she had been glad of the idea of maida's marriage to geoffrey for she knew of his sterling worth and she knew the depth and sincerity of their attachment don't say you won't let me mother maida spoke in a dull sad tone a tone of calm despair it must be so i'm not saying i love him i'm not saying much about it all but i tell you solemnly it must be and you must not raise a single word of objection if you do you will only make my hard lot harder but dear you must explain 
i am your mother i've always had your confidence and i ought to be told why you are doing this thing that's just the trouble mother i can't tell you and because of the confidence that has always been between us you must trust me and believe that i am doing right and doing the only possible thing oh it is all hard enough without having to argue about it why my will power may give out my soul's strength may break down mother don't don't combat me don't tempt me aside from the only straight line of duty and of right child you are not doing right you cannot have a duty of which i know nothing of which your father knows nothing maida my little girl what is this thing that has warped your sense of right and wrong has curtis keefe won your heart away from geoffrey no oh no never that but it would be a wrong to geoffrey for me to marry him it would be a wrong to to all of us by marrying mr keefe i can make everything right and she suddenly assumed an air of cold stern determination mother my mind is made up you cannot change it nor can you help me by trying you only make it harder for me and i beg of you to stop and then you know mother i killed mr appleby hush maida you never did i know you didn't but it was either i or father you don't believe he did it do you god help me i don't know what to believe but i tried to say i did it only i couldn't carry it out nor can you dear nor can father then oh mother i did do that shooting i did i did every assertion like that makes me more certain you didn't and mrs wheeler fondly caressed the head that lay on her breast maida was not hysterical but so deeply troubled that she was nervously unstrung and now gave way to torrents of tears and then ceased crying and bravely announced her plans please mother darling don't talk about that suppose i tell you that even that matter will be all set right if i marry curtis keefe and by no other means even mr stone can't find any other suspect than us three wheelers he doesn't at all believe in the bugler nobody does i do only as a last chance to free father and me mother it's an awful situation worse far worse than you know anything about won't you trust me to do what i know to be right and when i tell you i must marry mr keefe won't you believe me and not only believe me but help me help me in every way you can for god knows i need help what can i do darling asked sarah wheeler awed by the look of utter hopelessness on maida's face stand by me mother urge father not to oppose this marriage help me to tell geoffrey you tell him can't you mother i can't oh i can't again sarah wheeler broke out into protestations against this sacrifice of her loved daughter and again maida had to reaffirm her decision until both worn out they separated sarah promising to do just as maida wished in all things and in fulfillment of this promise sarah told young allan as she expected he was stunned by the news but where she had supposed he would show anger or rage he showed only a deep sympathy for maida poor little girl he said the quick tears springing to his eyes what dreadful thing can that man have held over her to force her to this and what is the best way for me to go about remedying the situation you know mrs wheeler maida wouldn't talk like that unless she had arrived at a very desperate crisis if she killed mr appleby she never did no power on earth can make me believe that why when maida's own confession doesn't convince me what else could 
no there's some deep mystery behind that murder i mean something far deeper and more mysterious than any of us yet realize i think mr stone is on track of the solution but he cannot have made much progress or if he has he hasn't told of it yet but i'm not a detective nor is any needed when mr stone is on the case but i am out to protect and clear my maida my darling poor child how she is suffering where is she don't go to her jeff at least not just now she begged that you wouldn't but i must i've got to no for her sake geoffrey dear for our maida's sake leave her alone for the present she is so worried and anxious so wrought up to the very verge of collapse that if you try to talk to her she will go all to pieces but that's all wrong i ought to soothe her to comfort her not make her more troubled you ought to i know but you wouldn't oh it isn't your fault it isn't that you don't love her enough not that she doesn't love you enough in fact that's just the trouble try to see it jeff maida is in the clutch of circumstances i don't know the facts you don't but it is true that the kindest thing we can do for her just now is to leave her alone she will do right as she sees it yes but she sees wrong i know she does the child has always been over conscientious and i'm positive that whatever she is up to it's something to save her father oh jeff then you believe he is why mrs wheeler don't you know whether your husband killed mr appleby or not i don't know heaven help me how can i know the two of them shielding each other wait a minute if they are shielding each other they're both innocent but it isn't that way mr wheeler said to me at first of course either maida or i did it we both know which one did it but if we don't tell no one else can know i see that point but i should think knowing both so closely as you do you could discern the truth and he gazed at her steadily you have yes i have of course as you say in such intimacy as we three are it would be impossible for me not to know and it was maida yes geoffrey how are you certain her father saw her saw her shoot yes then i'm glad you told me i'm going to marry her at once and have all rights of her protection through the trial if it comes to that nothing else could have convinced me of her act poor dear little maida i've known her capacity for sudden impulsive action but oh well if mr wheeler saw her that's all there is to be said now dear mrs wheeler you must let me go to my maida but geoffrey i only told you that to persuade you to let her alone let her have her own way she says that to marry curtis keefe will save her from prosecution even from suspicion she says he can free her from all implication in the matter by a fraud i don't know i won't have it if maida did that shooting she had ample excuse motive rather not a man on the jury would convict her and i'd rather she'd stand trial and oh no geoffrey don't talk like that i'd consent to anything to save that girl from a trial oh you can't mean you want her tried rather than to see her marry to any man but me i'd wait jeff we mustn't be selfish i'm her mother and as much as i'd hate to see her marry keefe i'd far prefer it for her sake than no a thousand times no why i won't give her up keefe is a fine man i've nothing against him but she's my maida my own sweetheart and for that reason for your own sake 
you're going to claim her it isn't only for my own sake jeff spoke more humbly but i know i know how she loves me to let her marry another would be to do her a grievous wrong not if she wants to look there mrs wheeler pointed from the window and they saw maida walking across the lawn in deep and earnest conversation with curtis keefe he was tall and handsome and the deferential air and courteous attitude all spoke in his favor maida was apparently listening with interest to his talk and they went on slowly toward the old sycamore and sat down on the bench beneath it our trysting place geoffrey murmured his eyes fastened on the pair it did not require over close observation to see that maida was listening willingly to keefe nor was there room for doubt that he was saying something that pleased her she was brighter and more cheerful than she had been for days you see said sarah wheeler sadly and he is a worthwhile man mr appleby thought very highly of him i don't said Allan, briefly and unable to stand any more he left the room he went straight to the two who were sitting under the big tree and spoke directly what does this mean maida your mother tells me you let me answer spoke up keefe gaily it means that miss wheeler has promised to marry me and we ask your congratulations are you not aware jeff's face was white but his voice was controlled and steady that miss wheeler is my fiance hardly that demurred keefe i believe there was what is called an understanding but i'm assured it has never been announced however the lady will speak for herself go away jeff maida pleaded please go away not until you tell me yourself maida what you are doing why does mr keefe say these things it is true maida's face was as white as allen's i'm going to marry mr keefe if you considered me bound to you i hereby break it off please go away the last words were wrung from her in a choked agonized voice as if she were at the end of her composure i'm going Allen said and went off in a daze he was convinced of one thing only that maida was in the power of something or some person some combination of circumstances that forced her to this he had no doubt she meant what she said had no doubt she would really marry keefe but he couldn't think she had ceased to love him her own geoffrey if he thought that he was ready to die he walked along half blindly thinking round in circles always coming back to the possibility now practically a certainty of maida being the murderer and wondering how keith meant to save her from the clutches of the law he was perturbed almost dazed and as he went along unseeingly genevieve lane met him turned and walked by his side what's curtis keefe doing with your girl she asked for the rolling lawn was so free of trees the pair beneath the sycamore could be plainly seen i don't know said allan honestly enough as he looked in the good-humored face of the stenographer i don't want him making love to her miss lane went on pouting a little first because she's altogether too much of a belle anyway and second because she paused almost scared at the desperate gaze allan gave her i hope you mean because you look upon him as your property he said but without smiling now just why do you hope that because in that case surely you can get him back oh what an aspersion on miss wheeler's fascinations hush i'm in no mood for chafing are you and keith special friends 
Genevieve looked at him a moment and then said very frankly, If we're not, it isn't my fault. And, to tell you the bald truth, we would have been, had not Miss Wheeler come between us. Are you sure of that? How rude you are! But yes, I'm practically sure. Nobody can be sure till they're certain, you know. Don't try to joke with me. Look here, Miss Lane. Suppose you and I try to work together for our respective ends. Meaning just what, Mr. Allen? Meaning that we try to separate Keefe and Maida, not just at this moment, but seriously and permanently. You, because you want him, and I, because I want her. Isn't it logical? Yes, but if I could get him back, don't you suppose I would? You don't get the idea. You're to work for me and I for you. Oh, I try to make Maida give him up and you... Yes, but we must have some pretty strong arguments. Now have you any idea why Maida has... Has picked him up with the tongs? I have a very decided idea. In fact, I know. You do. Is it a secret? It is. Such a big secret that if it leaked out, the whole universe, so far as it affects the Wheeler family, would be turned topsy-turvy. Connected with the... the death of Mr. Appleby? Not with the murder, if that's what you mean. But it was because of the death of Mr. Appleby that the secret came to light. Can you tell me? I can, but do I want to? What would make you want to? Why, only if you could do what you sort of suggested. Make Mr. Keefe resume his attentions to poor little Genevieve and leave the lovely Maida to you. But how can I do that? Don't know, I'm sure. Do you want me to tell you the secret, and then try to get my own reward by my own efforts? Oh, I don't know what I want. I'm nearly distracted, but... He pulled himself together. I'm on the job, and I'm going to accomplish something. A lot. Now, I'm not going to dicker with you. Size it up for yourself. Don't you believe that if you told me that secret, confidentially except as it has to be used in the furtherance of right and happiness for all concerned. Don't you believe that I might use it in a way that would incidentally result in a better adjustment of the present Keefe-Wheeler combination? He nodded toward the two under the sycamore. Maybe, Genevieve said, slowly and thoughtfully. I thought of telling Mr. Stone, but... Tell me first, and let me advise you. I will. I have confidence in you, Mr. Allen. And, too, it may be a good thing to keep the secret in the family. The truth is, then, that Mrs. Wheeler is not legally the heir to this estate. She is, if she lives in Massachusetts, and the house is so built. Oh, fiddlesticks, I don't mean that part of it. The estate is left with the proviso that the inheritor shall live in Massachusetts. But what I mean is that it isn't left to Mrs. Wheeler at all. She thought it was, of course, but there is another heir. Is there? I've often heard them speak of such a possibility, but they never could find a trace of one. I know it, and they're so honest that if they knew of one, they'd put up no fight. I mean, if they knew there is a real heir, and that Sarah Wheeler is not the right inheritor. Who is? Curtis Keefe. Oh, no. Miss Lane, are you sure? I am. I discovered it from Mr. Appleby's private papers since his death. Does Keefe know it? Of course, but he doesn't know I know it. Now see here, Mr. Allen, get this. Mr. Appleby knew it when he came down here. He, this is my own theory, but I'll bet it's the right one. He had discovered it lately. Keefe didn't know it. 
my theory is that he came down here to hold that knowledge as a club over the head of mr wheeler to force him to do his appleby's bidding in the campaign matters well then he was killed to prevent the information going any farther killed by whom genevieve shrugged her shoulders i can't say any one of the three wheelers might have done it for that reason no you're wrong neither mr nor mrs wheeler would have they'd give up the place at once your mental reservation speaks for itself that leaves maida suppose she knew it and the rest didn't suppose in order to keep the knowledge from her parents don't go on he begged i see it maybe it was so but what next next alas curtis keefe has fallen a victim to maida's smiles that's what's making more trouble than anything else i'm positive he is arguing that if she will marry him he will keep quiet about his being the heir then her parents can live here in peace for the rest of their lives i begin to see i knew you would now knowing this and being bound to secrecy concerning it except as you agreed if it can serve our ends where do we go from here allan looked at her steadily do you expect miss lane that i will consent to keep this secret from the wheelers you'll have to she returned simply maida knows it therefore it's her secret now if she doesn't want her parents told you can't presume to tell them allan looked blank and you mean she'll marry keith to keep the secret from her parents exactly that and there'd be no harm in keeping the secret that way for if curtis keith were her husband it wouldn't matter whether he was the rightful heir or not if he didn't choose to exercise or even make known his rights i see and as to the the murder genevieve helped him well i don't know if maida did it and i can't see any way out of that conclusion kurt will do whatever he can to get her off easily perhaps he can divert suspicion elsewhere you know he made up that bugler man and has stuck to him maybe he can get a person's unknown verdict or maybe with money and influence he can hush the whole thing up and anyway maida would never be convicted why possibly the threat of mr appleby if he did threaten could be called blackmail anyhow if there's a loophole curtis keefe will find it he's as smart as they make em now you know the probabilities almost the inevitabilities i might say what are we going to do about it something pretty desperate i can tell you fine talk but what's the first step do you want to know what i think i sure do then i say let's take the whole story to fleming stone and at once end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain maida and her father genevieve hesitated although she had thought of doing this herself yet she was not quite sure she wanted to but allan insisted come with me or not as you choose he said but i'm going to tell stone a secret like that must be divulged in the interests of law and justice and justice to whom asked genevieve why to all concerned allan stopped to think to to keefe for one he concluded a little lamely yes and to yourself for two genevieve exclaimed you want the secret to come out so maida won't marry kurt to keep it quiet own up now allan couldn't deny this but back of it was his instinctive desire for justice all round and he doggedly stuck to his determination of laying the matter before fleming stone 
Genevieve accompanied him, and together they sought Stone in his sitting-room. Fibsy was there, and the two were in deep consultation. "'Come in,' Stone said, as his visitors appeared. "'You have something to tell me, I gather from your eager faces.' "'We have,' Alan returned, and he began to tell his story. "'Let me tell it,' Miss Lane interrupted him impatiently. "'You see, Mr. Stone, Mr. Allen is in love with Miss Wheeler, and he can't help coloring things in her favor. "'And you're in love with Mr. Keefe,' Stone said, but without a smile, "'and you can't help coloring things in his favor.' The girl bridled a little, but was in no way embarrassed at the assertion. "'Take your choice, then,' she said flippantly. Who do you want to tell you the secret we're ready to give away? Both, Fibsy spoke up. I'll bet it's a worthwhile yarn, and we'll hear both sides, if you please. Ladies first. Pipe up, Miss Lane. The actual secret can be quickly told, the girl said, speaking a little shortly. The truth is that Mrs. Wheeler is not the legal heir to this estate of Sycamore Ridge but Mr. Keefe is. "'Curtis Keefe!' Stone exclaimed, and Fibsy gave a sharp, explosive whistle. "'Yes,' said Genevieve, well pleased at the sensation her words had produced. Not that her hearers made any further demonstration of surprise, Stone fell into a brown study, and Fibsy got up and walked up and down the room, his hands in his pockets, and whistling softly under his breath. "'Well,' the boy said finally, returning to his chair, "'well, F. Stone, things has changed since Grandma died, eh?' "'In many ways,' Stone assented. "'You're sure of this, of course?' he asked Genevieve. "'How do you know?' "'Well, I learned it from Mr. Appleby's papers.' "'Private papers?' Yes, of course. He didn't have them framed and hanging on his wall. You see, Mr. Keefe, being Mr. Appleby's confidential secretary, had access to all his papers after the old gentleman died. His son? Of course. Young Sam is the heir and owns everything, but he kept Kurt on, in the same position, and so Kurt, Mr. Keefe, went over all the papers. As stenographer and general assistant, I couldn't very well help knowing the contents of the papers, and so I learned the truth that Mr. Keefe, who is of another branch of the family, is really the principal heir to the estate that is now in Mrs. Wheeler's possession. I can't give you all the actual details, but you can, of course, verify my statements. Of course, mused Stone, and Mr. Keefe hasn't announced this himself because that's it genevieve nodded a sit to his meeting glance because he wants to marry maida and if she'll marry him he'll keep quiet about the airship or rather in that case it won't matter as the elder wheelers can live here if it's the property of their son-in-law but if not then when mr keefe walks in the wheeler family must walk out and where would they go I can take care of them, declared Alan. Maida is my promised wife. If she consents to marry Keefe, it will be under compulsion. For she knew this secret, and she dared not tell her people, because it meant poverty and homelessness for them. You know Mr. Wheeler is incapable of lucrative work, and Mrs. Wheeler, brought up to affluence and comfort, can't be expected to live in want. But I can take care of them. That is, I could, if they could only live in Boston. My business is there, and we could all live on my earnings if we could live together. The boy, for young Allen seemed scarcely more than a boy, was really thinking aloud as he voiced these plans and suggestions. But he shook his head sadly as he realized that Dan Wheeler couldn't go to Boston and that a marriage between Keefe and Maida was the only way to preserve to them their present home. "'Some situation,' remarked Fibsy. 
and the secret is no secret really for if miss wheeler doesn't marry mr keefe he'll tell it at once and if she does the whole matter doesn't matter at all but i think she will for what else can she do Jeffrey allen looked angrily at the boy but fibsy's funny little face showed such a serious interest that it was impossible to chide him i think she won't allen said but i'm not sure just yet how i'm going to prevent it you won't have to said stone miss wheeler will prevent it herself or i miss my guess he looked kindly at the young man but received only a half smile in return if we all do our share in the matter perhaps we can arrange things genevieve said speaking very seriously i've something to say for i am engaged to curtis keefe myself does he think you are stone said rather casually miss lane had the grace to blush through her rouge but she declared he doesn't want to and added but he ought to he has made love to me and he once asked me to marry him but since then he has said he didn't mean it i don't suppose i've enough evidence for a breach of promise suit but oh well and she tossed her pretty head i've not the least doubt that if miss wheeler were out of the question say safely married to mr allen i'd have no trouble in whistling my curdy back i bet you wouldn't fibsy looked at her admiringly if i were only a few years older hush terence said fleming stone don't talk nonsense immediately fibsy's face became serious and he turned his attention away from the fascinating genevieve but all this is aside the question of the murderer mr stone said allen how are you progressing with that investigation better than i've disclosed as yet stone returned speaking slowly recent developments have been helpful and i hope to be ready soon to give a report you expect mr appleby down yes tonight or tomorrow by that time i hope to be ready to make an arrest maida cried geoffrey the words seeming wrung from him against his will forgive me if i do not reply said stone with an earnest glance at the questioner but i'd like to talk to miss wheeler will you go for her mr allen i'd i'd rather not you see yes i see said stone kindly you go fibs i'll go offered genevieve with the result that she and mcguire flew out of the room at the same time all right beauteous one we'll both go fibsy said as they went along the hall side by side where is the lady don't know but we'll find her i say terence come down on the veranda just a minute first leading him to a far corner where there was no danger of eavesdroppers genevieve made another attempt to gain an ally for her own cause i say she began you have a lot of influence with mr stone don't you oh heaps and fibsy's sweeping gesture indicated a wide expanse of imagination at least no fooling i know you have now you use that influence for me and i'll do something for you what'll you do i don't know nothing particular but i mean if at any time i can help you in any way i've influence too with big men in the financial and business world i haven't always worked for the applebys and wherever i've been i've made friends that i can count on oh you mean a tip on the stock market or something of that sort yes or a position in a big worthwhile office you're not always going to be a detective's apprentice are you you bet i am what you talking about me leave f stone not on your fleeting existence but never mind that part of the argument i'll remember your offer and some day when i have a million dollars to invest i'll ask your advice where to lose it but now you tell me what you want 
only for you to hint to mr stone that he'd better advise miss wheeler not to marry mr keefe so's you can have him never mind that there are other reasons truly there are well then my orders are to advise f stone to advise m wheeler not to marry one c keefe that's just it but don't say it right out to him use tact which i know you have though nobody'd guess it to look at you and sort of argue around so he'll see it's wiser for her not to marry him why miss lane stamped her foot impatiently i'm not saying why that's enough for me to know you'll get along better not knowing does he know she's the the i don't wonder you can't say it i can't either yes he knows she's it but he's so crazy about her he doesn't care what is there in that girl that gets all the men it's her sweetness said fibsy with a positive nod of his head as if he were simply stating an axiom yep keefe is clean gone daffy over her i don't blame him though of course my taste runs more to don't you dare cried genevieve coquettishly to the rouge type fibsy went on placidly to my mind a complexion dabbed on is far more attractive than nature's tints miss lane burst into laughter and far from offended she said you're a darling boy and i'll never forget you even in my will now to come back to our dear old brass tacks will you tip a gentle hint to the great stone oh lord yes i'll tip him a dozen tactfully too don't worry as to my discretion but i don't mind telling you i might as well tip the washington monument you see f s has made up his mind as to the murderer yep who is it haven't an idea and if i had i'd say i hadn't you see i'm his trustee oh well in any case you can put in a word against mr keefe can't you but genevieve had lost interest in her project she realized if mr stone had accomplished his purpose and had solved the murder mystery he would be apt to take small interest in the love affairs of herself or maida wheeler either he won't think much of his cherished trustee if you don't do the errand he sent you on she said rather crossly fibsy gave her a reproachful glance this from you he said dramatically farewell fair but false i go to seek a fairer maiden and i know where to find her he went flying across the lawn for he had caught a glimpse of maida in the garden miss wheeler he said as he reached her will you please come now to see mr stone he wants you certainly she replied and turning followed him genevieve joined them and the three went to stone's rooms miss wheeler the detective said without preamble i want you to tell me a few things please you'll excuse me if my questions seem rather pointed also if they seem to be queries already answered did you kill mr appleby yes said maida speaking wearily as if tired of making the assertion you know no one believes that statement i can't help that mr stone she said with a listless manner that is no one but one person your father he believes it father exclaimed the girl in evident amazement yes he believes you for the best of all possible reasons he saw you shoot what mr stone my father saw me shoot mr appleby yes he says so that is not strange when as you say you fired the pistol from where you stood in the bay window and mr wheeler stood by or near the victim but i don't understand you say father says he saw me yes he told me that maida was silent but she was evidently thinking deeply and rapidly this is a trap of some sort mr stone she said at last my father didn't see me shoot 
he couldn't have seen me and consequently he couldn't say he did he wouldn't lie about it but he said at one time that he did the shooting himself was not that an untruth of a quite different sort he said that in a justifiable effort to save me but this other matter for him to say he saw me shoot when he didn't he couldn't why couldn't he miss wheeler why was it so impossible for your father to see you commit that crime when he was right there because because oh mr stone i don't know what to say i feel sure i mustn't say anything or i shall regret it would you like your father to come here and tell us about it no or yes oh i don't know Geoffrey, help me Allan had sat silently brooding all through this conversation he had not looked at maida keeping his gaze turned out of the window he was sorely hurt at her attitude in the keef matter he was puzzled at her speech regarding her father and he was utterly uncertain as to his own duty or privilege in the whole affair but at her appeal he turned joyfully toward her oh maida he cried let me help you do get your father here now and settle this question then we'll see what next call him then said maida but she turned very white and paid no further attention to Allan. she was still lost in thought when her father arrived and joined the group you said mr wheeler stone began at once that you saw your daughter fire the shot that killed mr appleby i did say that daniel wheeler replied because it is true and because i am convinced that the truth will help us all better than any further endeavor to prove a falsehood i did see you made a darling and i tried very hard to take the blame myself but it has been proved to me by mr stone that my pretense is useless and so i've concluded that the fact must come out in hope of a better result than from concealment do not fear my darling no harm shall come to you and you said you did it father and mother said she did it yes of course i told your mother the truth and we plotted yes plotted for each of us to confess to the deed in a wild hope of somehow saving our little girl and you saw me shoot father why yes dear that is i heard the shot and looked up to see you standing there with consternation and guilt on your dear face your arm had then dropped to your side but your whole attitude was unmistakable i couldn't shut my eyes to the evident fact that there was no one else who could have done the deed there must have been father for i didn't do it i knew you didn't oh maida with a bound allan was at her side and his arm went round her but she moved away from him and went on talking still in a strained unnatural voice but steadily and straightforwardly no i didn't shoot mr appleby i've been saying so to shield my father i thought he did it maida is it possible and daniel wheeler looked perplexed but oh i'm so glad to hear your statement but who did do it then miss lane asked bluntly who cares so long as it wasn't any of the wheelers exclaimed geoffrey allen unable to contain his gladness oh maida but again she waved him away from her i don't understand mr stone she began i don't know where these disclosures will lead i hope not back to my mother no maida said her father there's no fear of that reassured maida went on perhaps i can't be believed now after my previous insistence on my guilt but god knows it is the truth i am utterly innocent of the crime i believe it said fleming stone there was little evidence against you except your own confession now you've retracted that it only remains for me to find the real criminal can you cried fibsy excitedly 
can you f stone don't you know which way to look terence i do and i don't the boy murmured oh lordy i do and i don't but there's another matter to be agreed upon said maida who had not at all regained her normal poise or appearance her face was white and her eyes blurred with tears but she persisted in speech i want it understood that i am engaged to marry mr keefe she said not looking at geoffrey at all i announce my engagement and i desire him to be looked upon and considered as my future husband maida came simultaneously from the lips of her father and allan yes that is positive and irrevocable i have my own reasons for this and one of them is she paused one very important one is that mr keefe knows who shot mr appleby and can produce the criminal and guarantee his confession to the deed wow bibbs remarked explosively and fleming stone stared at the girl he used this as an argument to persuade you to marry him miss wheeler i don't put it that way mr stone but i have mr keefe's assurance that he will do as i told you and also that he will arrange to have a full and free pardon granted to my father for the old sentence he is still suffering under well maida i don't wonder you consented said miss lane her round eyes wide with surprise and i suppose he's going to renounce all claim to this estate yes said maida calmly anything else said allan unable to keep an ironic note out of his voice yes put in fibsy he's going to be governor of massachusetts oh my heavens and earth gasped genevieve what rubbish rubbish nothing fibsy defended his statement you know he's after it i felt sure he would when sam appleby gave up the running but i didn't know he had taken any public steps never mind what mr keefe is going to do or not going to do said maida in a tone of finality i expect to marry him and soon well said stone in a business-like way i think our next one to confer with must be mr keefe End of chapter 17